then, then I, I mean, is there anything you could be doing this morning that'd be better than this? No, no, no. I don't think there is. You could be sitting at home watching all about Hurricane Rita. Yeah. But you know what? It's going to be the same anyway, no matter whether you watch it or not. That's right. So we're coming here, and we're going to hear Dr. Gip give us some more. So when you come up, Dr. Gip, hey, give us some more. Man, well, we're going to get down to some serious sharing now. Uh, here's what I'm going to do. Uh, first thing I'm going to do this morning is I'm going to teach you how to correct the Bible in about 30 minutes. Okay? Um, if I go slow, it'll take 45. If, if I, I'd have to fake it to make it take an hour. Um, but, you know, you can do it in about a half an hour, 45 minutes max. And, and I'm going to teach you how to correct the Bible in a half an hour. Now... First off, let me say, you can't correct the Bible. Amen. Okay? But that's what guys do. That's right. And here's the problem. You guys believe the King James Bible is the Word of God, and that every word in that book, that, that book is word perfect, and, yep. and not a word should be changed. Amen. But you have to admit, or you may not admit it, but inside your head you have to admit that when some guy, you know, with a, with a bunch of degrees or whatever, stands behind a pulpit and says, now the Greek word here, uh, what it really means is this. Or uh, that word there in the King James Bible is mistranslation, and you are intimidated by their education. Yeah. yeah I mean, you won't say amen to that, but you are. And the reason I'm going to show you how to correct the Bible in half an hour is because the next time you hear one of those guys, I want you to know that you know how to do it. And then you go up and ask them and say, wow, how long did you go to college? Well, seven years. Oh, man, took you seven years to learn that? I didn't have an hour. <laughs> uh, amen. And then you can feel a little superior. <clears throat> All right? So we are going to, uh, uh, like I said, there you cannot correct the Bible. All right? Change one word of the Bible, and you have imperfection. Right? Yeah. Right. Amen. But, um, oh, man. Anyway, um. But the reason I'm going to do this is because this is the standard. I call this the Greek game. And, um, uh, you know, like all games, it has rules. This has only one rule. And I'm, I'm not kidding. I'm not, I'm not uh, overemphasizing it or anything else. Here is the one rule. And really, this is the rule for all modern Bible translating, all modern preaching. <clears throat> that rule is this. The King James Bible is always wrong. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you get that down... That'll make you look like a genius. If you just remember that the King James Bible is yeah. all... Now, the King James Bible is always right, okay? Yeah, yeah. I'll tell you what the truth there. Right. I said the rule that they work by is the King James Bible is always wrong. And so uh, you'll see that, that they can make... They, three guys could come to the same word in the King James Bible and change it three different ways. Right. Yeah. Right. And none of them will argue with each other that mine is more right than yours. Yeah. They'll all just say, yep, that one was wrong. Right. So the King James Bible is always wrong. Now, let me tell you what your problem is. Your problem is this, and you will not admit this either. <clears throat> but you are Gentiles, and because you are Gentiles, you worship education. Yes, mm -hmm. that's right. it. Amen. Um, now, I know some guys, you know, like to spout off about this particular term here, reverend. And you can see, oh, I don't use the term reverend. Good, you probably shouldn't. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> no sense of bringing it down too much. But, um, but you have to admit, now, now, now look up here at those two terms. One of those is an ecclesiastical or heavenly title. Right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, when a guy says this is reverend, what do you think he is? You think he's a, a dentist? <laughs> you see what I'm saying? And one of them is an educational type. Yeah. And he can be he can be a foot doctor. He can be a veterinarian. He can be a brain surgeon. He can be a heart surgeon. So this is educational, and this one is ecclesiastical. This one is earthly. This one is heavenly. Really, correct? Yeah. Connected yeah. with heaven. Yeah. And, and and when one of those two guys speaks, which one do you give most credence? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like yeah. right there. Yeah, that's right. And you can have like your pastor. He could he could read. He could study for ten years and read. 50 books on the King James issue and say the King James Bible is the absolute perfect word of God and some doctor who got his doctor's degree by sending all of his students to his alma mater. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yep. And they gave it to him honorary. Now look, an honorary degree is just that. It is an honor. 
okay? But remember this, it's like an honorary black belt in karate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wear it yeah. around the house, but don't go outside hey. and try to use it, you'll get yourself killed. Amen. Amen. Okay? Yeah. Now guys, I'm telling you, you're going to think I'm kidding when I say this, but remember Oz? What did the scarecrow want? He wanted a brain. Never got it. What did he get? He got a degree. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. You remember that? Yeah. In the movies. You know, he didn't get a brain. It's using the, 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 the what's the guy, the wizard, you know, he says, Oh, you don't need a brain, you just need and he gives him a piece of paper and he goes, Oh, he oh, oh. I mean they gave guy a piece of paper and he's a genius, okay? So um and so that has its place, but but here's the problem. If you didn't worship education, if a doctor, I don't care if this guy has been to college and, and teaches college and writes the, the curriculum, if your reverend said something contrary to him, you'd say, oh, well, it was a mere doctor that said that. It was a reverend that said this. But we don't do that. No. Because a Greek seeks after wisdom. Yeah. That's it. And we look for education. And I don't care how much you believe the King James Bible, you can't get past that. Okay? That is as natural as hunger pangs. It really is. You can't get past it. That's where we are. We look toward education. <clears throat> and that's why I got a doctor's degree. I got it for one simple reason. I figured if those guys are going to worship religion, then I'm going to make, make them worship mine. <laughs> <laughs> and it just unloads a lot of guns, okay? <clears throat> All right. Now, I told you I'm going to teach you how to um, <clears throat> correct the Bible. And then, and then I'm going to show you, uh, I'm going to teach you how to do the Greek game. Then I'm going to show it to you, uh, I'm going to show it to you in progress how it works. And then I'm going to give you a test, and you're going to flunk. Amen. Now, that's not so bad, except that I'm going to tell you how to pass. I'm going to tell you exactly. This is so easy. <laughs> I mean, it's like a, it's a, it's a, you only got two choices, and you're going to flunk. But don't feel bad about that, because you're supposed to flunk. <clears throat> because uh, everybody flunks. All right. <laughs> All right. Uh, open your Bibles, if you will, to uh, Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17, we're not going to look at anything there. I just want to see if it's in your version. <laughs> Matthew chapter 17. And what we're going to do this morning is we are going to, to study one Greek word. And that Greek word, that, that one Greek word is... Now that's the that, that that's it in the Greek. <clears throat> you want to see it in uh, transliterated? That's anaphero. <clears throat> we're going to um, we're going to study this particular Greek word. And honest guys, honest. Look, look, look I tell you, think, think, think. Right? Watch this. Uh, is there a song book? Yes, yeah, song book. All right. Now watch this. All right, there's my Bible. I, I pick a word, a Greek word, out of this, out of my Bible. Now, my Bible's over there, right? And I sit down over here at my desk, and I have, this is a Greek grammar book. Looks like a song book, it's in disguise. <clears throat> but this is a Greek grammar book, and I'm studying this Greek word. I'm not studying my Bible. That's right. Amen. Amen. How can you study your, your Bible when your Bible is over there? Amen. With Greek, you can study the Bible without the Bible being in the building. Uh -huh. It's not Bible study. Amen. Okay? So when somebody says, well, I'm just doing a little word study, say, why? Amen. You guys have seen, uh, what's the guy's name that does all the pictures of the lions and tigers and bears of I, the uh, Gothard guy? And, you know, the Bible says something about eagles, and so he tells you something about eagles. The Bible says something about lions, and he tells you. I mean, it's zoology, guys. It's not Bible. Amen. Okay? I mean, it's not Bible. Bible you need the Bible to study Amen. the Bible. You don't need a Greek grammar book to study the Bible. Amen. You wouldn't think that one was so hard to understand. <clears throat> anyway, now, I'm going to show you, I'm not even going to show you one way to correct the Bible. I'm going to show you any one of four. I'm not going to show you four, four steps to correcting the Bible. I'm going to show you four independent ways. You can pick the one you like. This is how easy it is to correct the Bible. The first one <clears throat> is real easy. Get a, 
Bible commentary. Okay? You get just about any Bible commentary. I say just about any Bible commentary. And inevitably, somewhere in there, the guy that is writing that commentary will come to a Greek word and he'll say, now that Greek word, may, or that word uh, translated this way in the King James Bible should have been translated this way. Yep. Uh, I'll guarantee the exceptions are Doc Ruckman and mine. I don't do that. And, um, and there's, there may be another one or two out there, but, but as a rule, you, you say, well, Oliver B. Green, uh, he was a King James Bible player, still is. He's still getting mail. Guy's been dead for 20 years, and he's still on the radio. Doesn't it worry you when all of our best preachers on the radio have been dead for yeah. 20 years? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Come on, that's right. I mean, I heard Oliver B. Oliver B. Green not long ago, he said, uh, he said, pray for me, pray for me, I'm not feeling very good. And I thought, well, you know, if that's all you can say, I'm 20 years being dead, that's not bad. <laughs> And then he said, uh, oh, I got a letter from him the other day. And I thought, they must have a mailbox for a tombstone. You know, <laughs> hey, another one. Oh, oh, you know. But, uh, but Oliver B. Green was a King James Bible man, okay? But if you get any of his Bible commentaries, he corrects yeah. the Bible from the Greek. Now, look, guys, you men, you get an opportunity to get behind a pulpit, and here's what you want to do. You want to impress somebody with your brain, yep. mm -hmm. and you don't want to work. <laughs> That's the truth. So why spend hours in this book when you can spend a half an hour in a Bible commentary and then go golfing? And that's what everybody does. You get this Bible commentary, and, and, in the, and nowadays, guys, nowadays, you don't even have to buy the, the book. They're, they're uh, in a CD with a format with about 40 other Bible commentaries, and you can even print this thing out, and it'll be, on your, it'll be in your notes, and nobody even know that you got it from some, some guy that was correct in a book. They'll think you actually studied, Okay. But all you got to do is get a Bible commentary and you'll, whatever passage you're studying and you come to that point and say, now, now the Greek word here should have been this. And everybody's going to go, wow, man, that guy really knows something. Yeah, he does, but not Bible. Amen. Yeah. I was at a, I was at a, uh, uh, I was youth director at a large church back in Ohio and <clears throat> we had a talent contest. That's a nice spiritual thing that uh, all these churches got together and did. And they had a preaching contest and a 14-year-old boy. Now, I got news for you, bucko. They're in a public school in, in this country that's, that gives Greek at, in, at, at age 14. And he got up and corrected the King James Bible from the pulpit. Now, you think he knew Greek? Of course he didn't know Greek. He, did, he just got him a Bible commentary. Probably learned that from his pastor. Sure. Okay? Uh, I'll tell you what I had happen. I was, uh, <clears throat> I was at a Bible conference. I wasn't speaking there. And I'm at this Bible conference, and this was many years ago. And this guy was preaching. He's preaching out of Romans chapter 8, and he gets down to a verse, and he gets down to a word, and says, <clears throat> now, the, now the, you know, here's that. So they always sound like, you know, these guys, it's kind of like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to poke your eyes out. I feel so bad about it. <laughs> Well, now, you know, uh, this is such an unfortunate translation in the King James Bible. I hate to have to rip this thing up. <laughs> and, uh, and then he goes to this, in, in Romans chapter 8, he goes to one verse, goes yeah. to one word, and says, this word in the King James Bible is mistranslated. It should have been translated this way. Yeah. Well, the next day, I hear a guy preaching on the radio out of, out of Romans chapter 8. Same passage. Gets to the same verse gets to the same word and says. Now, this is an unfortunate translation in the King James Bible. And I said, yeah, I know, I know. It's supposed to be translated this way. And he said it should be translated this way. Uh -huh. And his way is a whole different way from guy number number one that I heard yesterday. Or actually, guy number two. Now, I have, I have four choices here. You say, four, yes. I can believe the guy that I heard last night that, you know, led me to Christ or was my pastor or signed my Bible or whatever. Or I can believe the guy on the radio who, instead of giving it to my church, I send my tithe to. Or I can believe the King James Bible. Or I can, I can turn to my God. Me. Mm -hmm. yeah. In which case, I believe the guy that I heard last night in Romans chapter 8, but I believe the guy on the radio in Romans chapter 9 because I like him better in 9, but I don't like him in 8, but I didn't like this guy in 9. And if I don't like either one of them, I can believe the King James Bible in chapter 10. And in chapter 11, I can make my own changes. That is exactly what happens. Yeah, right. That is right. exactly what happens. All right. <clears throat> the second thing. Now, now, this one would take a certain amount of 
of knowledge of the Greek language. Get a Greek lexicon. Now a lexicon, that's not a little short red-haired guy from Ireland, okay? <laughs> And, uh, and you get a Greek lexicon, and here's what you will find. You'll find that most Greek words have four or five or six different ways that that word could be translated. <clears throat> it could have been translated this to mean this, or this, or this. And um, I'm going to give you what the lexicon says, and I have the analytical Greek lexicon, I'm going to give you what the lexicon says, are the choices for anaphero. It can be translated to bear. It can be translated to carry upwards. It can be translated <clears throat> to lead up. It can be translated to offer. It can be translated to bear aloft. And it can be translated to sustain. Now, <clears throat> it just uh, this, this word works out real good for us because it has enough choices where we can correct the Bible with them. All right, so here's what here's what it can be translated. That Greek word right there, on pharaoh, <clears throat> it could be translated to bear, like, like like you're bearing something on your back, or to carry upwards, or to lead, or, or to offer. Uh, or to bear aloft, or to sustain. Now, <clears throat> obviously, and I had a guy, uh, I was teaching one time, and another guy described it this way, and I'd never, I'd never done it, but he but I understood it. He came up to me, and this guy used to correct the Bible. I mean, up to this very lesson, he corrected the Bible with the Greek. He's a King James Bible man. He was just doing what they taught him at his, at his Bible college. Yep. And he said, you know, I see from what you're showing us, what you showed us, he said, and his, his word was crisis. He said, when the King James translator sat down and came to a Greek word and had all these choices, they had a crisis. And that crisis was, which one do we choose? And he said, when they, when they made their choice, whatever it was, that crisis was closed. And I said, okay. He said, when I stand behind the pulpit and say, now that word has several different ways to be translated, I reopen that crisis. And I said, yeah, that's, that's a good description. I hope you can handle it. All right, <clears throat> so... Take a look at Matthew chapter uh, uh, Matthew chapter 17. Because in Matthew chapter 17, the Greek word on a pharaoh appears. And it says this in verse 1. And after six days, Jesus taketh uh, Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart. All right, you see where it says bringeth them up? That is the Greek word on a pharaoh. Okay? You can see this doesn't even say bring, but it would come kind of a lead up. Uh, uh, that's about what it would, would be, or barrel off. Uh, but anyway, um, so, so the King James translators did this. Now, here's what you do. If you want to show people how smart you are, find whatever the King James translators chose and expound on one of the other choices. Yeah. It does not matter which one. If the King James Bible translators <clears throat> chose, for some reason, way number two, then you know one thing. What do you know? They're wrong. The King James Bible is always wrong. Yeah. So, <clears throat> instead of talking about uh, how they were right, just uh, expound on way number four. Now, here's the problem. The problem is, four pages later, they may have translated that word the very way you want it. Is it right? Yeah. No. King James Bible is always wrong. <laughs> it's always wrong. So, when you get to it there, you expound on why it should have been like this, or even like this, okay? And you say, oh, who would do that? Oh, about 95% of the preachers in the country. Yeah. yeah. That's why. And let me, let me tell you why they do it. They're not wicked and horrible and ungodly. They went to Bible college and never learned Bible. Amen. Right? That's right. Okay, that's the problem. And they've got to they've got to stand before these people four times a week and impress them in some way. Yep. They were never taught to read their Bible, never taught to study their Bible, never taught to believe their Bible, <clears throat> but they were taught, get a Greek grammar book and go through it and, and, and you'll be okay. So that's why they do it. Now, gentlemen, can I talk to you married men for a second? I want you to, I told you, think, think, would you think? You're going to have a guest over and, and uh, your wife, you know, is going to prepare a special supper. And I mean, she does. Boy, she, she puts out a, 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 a roast and, uh, you know, 
fried chicken and, and dumplings and, and the corn on the cob and, and rolls. I mean, she really, she really lays it out there. And this guy wants to impress you with how much he knows about cooking. So as he's partaking of this meal, he looks to your wife and says, you know, uh, if you just put a little pinch of salt in these biscuits, they won't be quite so bland. <laughs> And, 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 and if you roast the chicken, if you'll, if you'll roast this chicken at 250 for three hours instead of 350 for two hours, it probably wouldn't be so dry and tough. <laughs> and, and this guy, I mean, categorically disassembles your wife's meal. Are you going to go, wow, he really knows something about cooking? Yeah. You better kill him or she will. <laughs> Somewhere in that meal, you're going to grab that guy and say, what do you, who do you think you are, man? I mean, you're tearing this whole meal up. Get out of my house. You wouldn't let somebody do that to your wife's cooking. You'll let them do it to your Bible. Yeah, how about that? Yeah. Guys, yeah. stand up and go, the Bible's wrong here, and God was wrong here, and God couldn't preserve it here, and, and it's, it's messed up here, and scratch this up here. And people go, wow, this guy really knows something. Yeah, but not Bible. Man, yeah. All right. <clears throat> Now there is a third one. <laughs> Get a concordance. <clears throat> now I use a Young's analytical concordance. It's just the one that I've always used. I kind of like it. And, and here's what the uh, Young's concordance will do. It will tell you a particular Greek word or Hebrew word. It'll tell you how many, word, how many times that word appears in the Bible and how many different ways it was translated, and how many times it was translated that way. So, you don't have to know Greek. You do have to understand, you have to be able to recognize the word, obviously. So there's a little bit of work in this, but <clears throat> we're doing the Greek word on a pharaoh, so I'll tell you what, what the King James translators did with on a pharaoh. They translated it to bear one time. Oh, no, I'm sorry, two times. Two times. They translated it, bring up, one time. They translated it carry up one time. They translated it lead up one time. They translated it offer two times and they translated it offer up Three times. Alright? Total of ten times. Now, if you have the if you have this analytical, or I mean if you have a, a concordance, uh, and, and the nice thing about this is that you can use the translator's words against them. Because, because they're always wrong. Right. And it's I mean it's really great when you can use their words. And so here's what you do. Uh, this bring up, obviously, this is Matthew chapter 17, verse 1. Uh, all of these in the, in the concordance, all of these have the reference beside them. I just didn't give you the reference. <clears throat> but you just go to where the King James translator has translated it, let's say, way number 2, and expound on way number 4. You know, he brought them up. No. I mean, it's he brought them up. Isn't that a poor choice of words, beloved? Hmm. He led them up. Our dear Savior was a leader. Yeah. And so he, they knew as they walked behind him, they had confidence because he was a leader. And it wasn't he, they just, you bring groceries into the house, but a leader leads. Yeah. Guys, that's exactly how it's done. Yeah, yeah that's right. That is exactly how it's done. And you're going, wow, oh, yeah. You're probably thinking you don't want to be translated to lead yourself now. Yeah. All right? <laughs> just remember... That when when you get to where they translated it, lead, is it right? No, no. no it's never right. The King James Bible translators are never right. Now, I reserve. Oh, whoa, whoa, wait a second. I can give the fourth one. Got to give the fourth one. Then we'll get back to this. <clears throat> and this one, <coughs> this one is kind of kind of diabolical. Get an interlinear. Greek, English, New Testament. Yeah. Now, I probably have one. Yep, right there. Right there. 
this happens to be a Greek, uh, uh, oh, okay, this is a Greek, Greek interlinear, King James, and NI, uh, or, um, uh, NIV, NIV. But <clears throat> here's what you got. You got uh, King James here, New International here, and the Greek text here. But a lot of them, what they'll do is, well, here's what you got. You've got Greek, and then underneath, when it says interlinear, it has the little translation underneath the Greek word. And, and they'll make these with a King James Bible. I hate to say this, but Bob Jones sells these a lot. And it's got the King James text on this side, it's got the Greek text on this side, and then the literal translation under the Greek word. Now, and, and the kick is that they come, this use, if I came to the pulpit with that, what would you think? What does he got? Right? Yeah. But all you got to do is walk up with something that looks like that. Sure. Yeah. And, and they make them, and they're, they're like maroon leather or black leather with gilted page, ribbon marker, and you think the guy's walking up with a whole Bible, and what it is, it's, it's an interlinear Greek New Testament, and here's the kick. The guy can be, he can be preaching or reading, and look over here and go, oh, and you know what? You know, that word that was translated this way, he'll see that maybe there's another choice over here. Go, now, literally in the Greek, it means this. And they're going to go, wow, this guy can translate on the run. <laughs> I mean, this guy, hey, come on. If he can do that, he's pretty sharp. Yeah. And he ain't doing that. And, or he can say this. Now, of course, here, and here's what they do. I'm telling you, I've seen them. They'll use the King James English and the, and the Nestle's Greek text. And the King James English didn't come from the Nestle's Greek text. Yeah. So he'll be sitting here, he could be reading Acts chapter 8 and look at verse 37 and say, Now, beloved, you know, I, I hate to tell you that, that that verse is not in the Greek text. It is not in the original. And you can come up and say, Preacher, what are you doing removing it from the Bible? And he goes, well, look right here. There's the Greek. Yes. Verse 35, verse 36, verse 38. That verse was put there by the King James translators. It's not in the Greek. And you're going to go, how do you refute that? I saw it myself. Yep. That's how you do it. Mm. Now, <clears throat> uh, I've had a few years of Greek. And I've studied this for a while. And, so, and I know how to play the game. I know how to play the game. So I reserve the right to play the game. Right? Sure. Can I play the game? Sure. 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 So I'm going to play. Let's go to, let's go to um, Matthew chapter 17 and verse 1. And now, now forgive me for the next few seconds. I'm going to be a fundamentalist. And this pains me greatly. I'm telling you, nothing hurts me than, than to talk like a fundamentalist. I mean, it, it, it's unnatural. And, um, yeah. but, but okay, here's it. Beloved. They always start that. Story. They always say, "Beloved and dear Lord." I always worry about that. Uh, I want to share this with you. As you know, I was doing my study. Yeah, did you ever... <clears throat> I'm not going to be a fun minute for a second. I've got. To... <laughs> I have to leave him alone. Uh, I get these guys. I talk, talk to these students, and they'll go, "Well, my Greek professor does his daily Bible devotions from the Greek New Testament." And I always ask them. I always say, "How do you know?" Like, come on, how's he know? Yeah. Yeah. His Greek professor tells me. Sure. That's what, you know, I do my daily devotions from the Greek New Testament. That's what they do. They, they tell yeah. me. <clears throat> you know, as I was, uh, <laughs> as I was doing my, my devotions this week from my Greek New Testament, like none of you idiots can, <laughs> because you're uneducated and not as smart as me. I mean, yeah, amen. Leave him over there for a second. Hey, come on, guys. Let me ask you a question. You go to Bible college, and it's like twenty thousand bucks a year. Yep. You go for four years, you put eighty thousand bucks in this thing. That's a dodge bike. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, if you spent eighty thousand dollars on a car, don't you want to show it off? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. But what do you do when you take 80,000 bucks and put it in your cranium where nobody can see it? You know what you do? You want to show it off. Yeah. Yeah. So you get up and go, now, beloved, you know, I have put $80,000 in my head. <laughs> and this brain right here has $80,000 in my head. And I want you to know that I now have the ability. <laughs> now, none of you have that ability because it does have a brain like mine. But I have this brain right here that has $80,000 in this head. And so I'm able to do this. Don't try this at home. You'll hurt yourself. <laughs> You'll pull a muscle in your brain. <laughs> 
a ghost. It's hard to do. <laughs> Below. Here in Matthew chapter 17 is a, one of those one of those places, one of those unfortunate places in our dear King James Bible. I love the King James Bible. <laughs> and after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart. Now, I know because of your, your great ignorance that you don't know that the Greek word that was translated bringeth them up there is the Greek word anapharo. And the Greek word anapharo, that is, that is such a poor choice of translation that the King James translators made. In fact, in my personal Bible study, when I checked my analytical Greek lexicon, I found that bring them up isn't even one of the options. So the King James translators formulated this very translation right out of the thin air. But they themselves, they themselves translated it bear and carry up and lead up and offer and offer up. And so you see, see my beloved, what Jesus was actually doing was he was leading them up to offer them as a sacrifice. He was going to lead them up that mountain and hack them to pieces. And you see, that's what the literal Greek says. And aren't you glad you have me? Guys, that's exactly what they do. That's exactly what they do. And when a guy says it should be translated this way, if you want to say, well, what do I do? I'll tell you what you do if you want to be a little, a little ambitious. If you know a little Greek, get the lexicon or get a, get a concordance, go to that word. And when you say, yeah, the guy said it could have been translated this way, then just find one and show how ridiculous you can be. Okay? Just show how ridiculous that you can be. And I need my teaching notebook. Just remember that. Um, hey, babe, it's over there. Would you grab it for me, please? My, uh, my teaching notebook, it's underneath. Uh... Okay, Gary, you get it? Because now I'm going to show you this. I'm now going to show you. I'm going to show you this. <clears throat> in progress, and I, I need some information out here. Thank you very much. You don't get paid for that. Thank you for saying I don't share. I'm a Christian. <laughs> All right. Uh, open your Bibles to uh, Acts chapter 3. Yes. Acts chapter 3. <clears throat> and, and, and what I'm going to show you now is extremely exciting to me. Oh, by the way, I'm done teaching you how to correct the Bible. And I don't know if it took, took a whole half an hour. Uh, I know it didn't take 45 minutes because it does. It, I can, if, you need, if you need an hour to learn how to do this, you really shouldn't use a fork when you eat. <laughs> but now here's the thing, guys. See, here's the thing. Now, you know what you can do? When, now, and I'm going to tell you, I'm telling you, when a guy stands by a pulpit and says, a better translation is, or the original Greek says, yeah. that is what he's doing. Amen. Yeah. And if you're going to go, well, he's, but he's been to seminary. He's had seven years of college. He must be slow. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you can learn it in a half an hour, it takes him seven years, he shouldn't use the fork. <laughs> All right. Acts chapter 3, and, and I'm excited about what I'm going to show you because I, I used to teach this, and every time I taught this, I prophesied. I really did. And then I was on nationwide TV, and my prophecy was fulfilled, and it was just a thrill. Uh, <clears throat> here's what it is. Um, look at your King James Bible, Acts chapter 3, and uh, verse 13. The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom you delivered up <clears throat> and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. Uh, look at verse 26. Unto you first, God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you <clears throat> in turning away uh, every one of you from his iniquities. Chapter 4, verse 27. That is a nice ring to it. Yeah, 27. That's not what I want. Um, hold on, I have it written down here. Yeah, I do want that. Oh, yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, it's, it's in English, and I was having trouble with it. <laughs> $80,000 got sideways in my brain. Um, <clears throat> verse 27. For of a truth, uh, against, this, uh, against thy holy child Jesus, Amen. whom thou hast uh, anointed, and so on and so forth. Now look at verse 30. 
uh, by stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done uh, by the name of thy holy child Jesus. Amen. of a, and I don't use this word, okay? Well, I'll use the real word. Queer pride. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a gay pride parade in New York City, and they have, they're carrying banners, and they have two symbols. They have the lambda, the Greek letter lambda, which is for some reason their symbol, and they have that one. Yeah. They got the symbol of the New King James. The homosexuals are carrying it on their banner. Buddy, I, I, don't, I wouldn't want any Bible I used. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Anyway, so this is disguised as a Bible, but it's really a New King James Version. And go back to chapter 3, and I'm going to read those four verses out of the New, New King James. Now, remember, when they translated this, here's, how, here's what they said. Making a good thing better. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, making a perfect thing corrupt. Amen. Amen. Yeah, yeah. Proof. <clears throat> Verse 13. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his servant, Jesus. Okay, so now the sonship of Jesus Christ has been denied at least one time here that it wasn't done in King James. Verse 26. To you first, God having raised up his servant, Jesus. Chapter 4, verse 27. For truly against your holy servant, Jesus. Verse 30. By stretching out your hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Now, guys, have you ever heard this, <clears throat> you know, that um, I can find the fundamentals in these new versions or, you know, everything else? Yeah. Well, I got news for you. If you can find the sonship of Jesus Christ in a new King James, I can find it at least four more times in the King James Bible. Amen. Amen. Yep. So which one's better? Right. They said, well, it's only four more times. Would you like to find a soldier in a firefight that wouldn't like uh, four, more, four more men or four more bullets? That's yeah. Right. You would find a dying man wouldn't like four more minutes of life? Okay, yeah, good. Yeah. so so this is weaker than the King James yeah, Bible. Right, right. But I'm going to show you why they did what they did and, and how they did it and what they how they justified it. All right, the Greek word that uh, that was translated son and child uh, in your Bible is the Greek word paida. Uh, it's, a, it's a form of pios. And uh, we transliterate it this way. Paida. Alright? <clears throat> now, here's what you got to remember. Sometimes Bible correctors do not lie. Sometimes. Sometimes they only tell you half truth. But inevitably they tell you the wrong half. So, now what I'm going to do, and this is painful, but I'm going to be a New King James translator. And I'm going to justify those four corrections. Beloved, the word that was translated son in Acts chapter 3, verses 13 and 26, and child in Acts, chapters, uh, cha Acts chapter 4, <clears throat> verse uh, uh, 27 and, uh, and uh, 30, is not the Greek word for those two words. The Greek word that was translated son and child is the Greek word paida. Now, the Greek word for son is huios. And the Greek word for child is technon. And by the way, that is, I mean, that's, that's fine. And so, you see, uh, beloved, your King James Bible, I know, I know, now don't please, I, I love the Bible. I'm not trying to hurt your Bible. I know you have zeal about your King James Bible. But, but this, is a, this is just one of those unfortunate mistranslations of a King James Bible. 
For the Greek word is for, for son is not found in Acts chapter 3. And the Greek word for child is not found in Acts chapter 4. It is pida, which is the Greek word for servant. So we of the New King James Translation Committee have changed these four mistakes in your King James Bible and correctly translated servant. Ah, you know what's wrong? I gave you a half-truth, and you know even you sitting here right now, if I send you home right now, some of you are going to be upset about your King James Bible. Mm. Some of you sitting there right now go, well, what do you do? I mean, it wasn't the Greek word for son. That's not the Greek word for son, and it's not the Greek word for child. Well, <clears throat> let me just tell you this. I'll start off by saying this. Let's see if anybody knows a little Greek here. Ah. I'm trying to remember how this one goes. Doulos. Does anybody know what the, what the Greek word doulos is? It's a Greek word for servant. Now, what I'd like to have happen <clears throat> right now is some questions that will be starting in your mind. Like, how can this be the Greek word for servant and this be the Greek word for servant? And here's the answer. The answer is that <clears throat> we os is the dedicated word for son. In other words, weos means son, period. Technon means child. Doulos means servant or slave. Pios or pida has numerous meanings that I will give you. Pida can be translated servant, Oh, I'm sorry. Here, I started in the second line. I don't want to get, get ahead of myself. <clears throat> I'll give them to you in the order they were in my, in my lexicon. Pius can be translated child. That is one of the legitimate translations. So doesn't that take care of Acts chapter 4? Yeah. 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 So why were they so quick to remove the sonship from Jesus Christ hmm. when it could be translated child? Pius can be translated child. Youth, boy, girl, maiden, servant, slave, attendant, or minister. All right? Now, you see, when I, when I gave you that definition, I wasn't telling the whole truth, was I? And that's what they do. Now, now here's where I prophesied. Here's where I prophesied, and this was so cool. Um, do you notice there's still a problem here? You know what the problem is? You don't see sun in there. So there's no justification for this. And, and for years... I would teach this as I'm teaching it to you, and I would say this. <clears throat> uh, they, they're going to say that, that we also take down the word for son and child, and that pine is the word for servant. And I said, you tell them that doulos is also the word, the dedicated word for servant, and then give them these definitions for, pi, for pida that justifies child. And I said, here's what they're going to do. They're going to say, but you don't see the word son. Ten years ago, I was doing the John Ankerberg TV program, and we're debating, uh, there's three of us against uh, six. It was five panelists and, and John Ankerberg himself. But uh, it was uh, Kenneth, Kenneth Parker, head of the New International Version Committee, uh, James White, alias Snow White. Yeah. And, uh, Amen. and uh, next to him was Art Farstad, head of the New King James Version uh, Translation Committee, uh, Don Wilkins from the New American Standard Committee, and a guy by the name of Dan Wallace, an eminent scholar, from uh, Dallas Theological Seminary. And, <clears throat> and they, they sprung this on me. They, they and honest guys, before that happened, John Ankerberg bought two sets of everything I had because they knew they couldn't refute my material. Mm. So I, I think he gave one to James White. And, and then what Ankerberg did is he, he pre-programmed each one of those guys and he said, look, you study this and nail them on this, and you study this and nail them on this. And somewhere along the line, they missed my material on that. 
So on this TV program, on Nate by Love and Sheet, uh, John Ackerberg has these verses from the King James Bible, son, son, child, child. Then he holds them up in front of the camera, servant, 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 new King James. And he goes, now Dr. Giff, what's wrong with that? <laughs> oh, did I bite. I'm here, hey. buddy. I did my best, just got off the load of pumpkins imitation. Why? Well, <laughs> you know, I, uh, I took the sonship of Jesus out there four times. I mean, they can't do that. And, and he knew he had me. And he goes, well, Dr. Farstad, would you like to explain that? <laughs> and Farstad says, well, the Greek word for son is weos, and the Greek word for uh, child is technon, and the Greek word there is pita, and it's the word for servant. And stop right there, just like I said he would do. <laughs> and I said, and, that's, and then I, I got off the truck completely. <laughs> and I said, yes, but I said, uh, I said, doctor, the Greek word for servant is doulos, right? Yes. And I said, pita can be translated, and I went down through all of these. And he did exactly what I said they would do. He said, but the Greek word, the, the, the son, son, is not a choice. And I said, you're right. Go to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. John chapter 4, in verse 49, you have a nobleman whose, whose child is sick. And he goes to Jesus Christ. Now look at verse 49. The nobleman saith unto him, Sir, come down, ere my child die. Jesus saith unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. Uh, and the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, uh, and he went his way. Uh, and as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. Hey, would anybody like to guess what the Greek word for that is? The Greek word used for son in that verse is not bios. It's pida. Yeah. They used a choice they didn't have. New King James Version, verse 51. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Your son lives. How about that? And I said, Dr. Farstad, you guys used son for Pida when you didn't have any authority when it was describing the son of a nobleman, but you wouldn't use it when it was describing the son of God. Man, uh, boom. Hey, boom. It was wonderful. <laughs> we just had a little fun. We hung him on the hey. barn door. <laughs> $80,000 was ripping out of his ear. <laughs> So, so here, the only reason I'm telling you this is, uh, the only reason I told you that is this. Even you guys are going to be somewhere and some guy's going to say, now the Greek word in your King James Bible is translated this way, should have been this way, and he's going to give you proof and, and leave you with half the proof. Yeah. And because of your heart and because we worship, uh, you know, we worship education, yeah. you are going to walk out with a little doubt. All I'm telling you is he's not telling you the whole thing. That's okay? Right. All right, now I'm going to give you a test. Oh, I don't close that. Oh, no. Uh, look at John chapter 21. John chapter 21. And I, I, forgive me, I have to do it. I have to do it. I have to become a fundamentalist once again. I'm going to have to lay down after this is over. This, this really, it, it really uh, wears me out. And I have to recover. But um, I'm going to read this passage. I'm going to read out of John chapter 21. I'm going to read three verses. And I'm going to read them exactly the way I have heard them read by a fundamentalist. I'm going to, hear, I'm going to read them as many of you have heard them read. So I'm going to be a fundamentalist for a few seconds. Uh, John chapter 21, verse 15. So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith to him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith to him again, uh, again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, 
Thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus said that him, feed my sheep. Now, beloved, I, I hate to inform you because, you know, I love the King James Bible. I don't use any of these modern perversions. I wouldn't have a modern perversion in my office except for maybe a New American Standard, a New King James, a New International, and a New Contemporary English version that I might consult periodically to correct this one. But, <clears throat> but um, you know, this is one of those classic passages that show the weakness of the King James Bible. For you see, you who are uneducated and ignorant, unlike me who has eight thousand dollars in his way, don't know the truth about this passage. And so I will illustrate how fallible and untrustworthy your King James Bible is. Because I love it. And I just want to show you how smart I am. In, uh, in verses 15, 16, and 17, our dear Lord asked Peter, Peter, lovest thou me? And when he says to Peter, do you love me? In verse 15, he says, Peter, do you love me with agape love? Yeah. Now, there are two kinds of love. Uh, in the, actually, there's three kinds of love in the Greek language. There's uh, agape and, and uh, phileo and eros, which is where you get the word erotic from. But uh, that's not in the Bible. <clears throat> but anyway, uh, it is in some of those guys' offices, but it's not in the Bible. <laughs> <clears throat> um, now, now, these two Greek words, uh, agape and phileo. Agape is a deep, intimate, selfless love. It's, the, it's that love you just give yourself totally to. And phileo is kind of a casual, friendly love. You know, it's like the gas station attendant. Oh, hi, buddy. How you doing? How's the family? And our dear Lord, when he asked Peter, do you love me? He said, Peter, do you love me with a deep, intimate, selfless love? And you know, Peter hedged at that kind of a commitment. And so he didn't say, I love you with agape love. He said, Lord, I love you, but I love you with phileo love. Kind of a casual, friendly love. Not getting the answer that he wanted. Our dear Lord said again, Peter... Lovest thou me with a deep, intimate, selfless love? And Peter, again hedging like maybe some of you, said, Lord, I love you with a casual, friendly love. And of course, that broke the Lord's heart. And so he gave up, and in verse 17, he said, Okay, then, Peter, lovest thou me with a, with a casual, friendly love? And Peter was grieved. You saw it in the passage. He was grieved because the Lord changed from agape to phileo. And he said, yes, Lord, I love you with a casual, friendly love. And see, here's the problem, beloved. Because, because you're ignorant and uneducated, unlike me, you're bound by the English and you don't know these great truths. Aren't you glad you have me here? With my... Now I'm done. I'm done being a fundamentalist. Amen. <laughs> yeah, it's painful. <clears throat> now, I am going to tell you, I am going to tell you what's true about this passage. Yeah. What's true about what I said is that Jesus Christ said, agape, in verse 15, and Peter answered with phileo, in verse 15. The Lord said, agape, in verse 16. Peter answered with phileo. And the Lord said, phileo, in verse 17. And Peter said, phileo. Let me ask you this. How many of you have ever heard or read uh, that, that approach to John chapter 21? Yeah. A bunch of and, again, now, if I leave it there, even right now, if right. I leave it there, right. if I say, let's go home, you know what you're going to do? You're going to go, well, he's right. I mean, what do you do? You heard him. Let me ask you a question. I'm driving down the street. I see a traffic sign. This sign has eight sides and is red and has a word in white. What is it? How do you know? Because they're all like that. Right? Right? If I describe a stop sign, you know, you know, I was in Romania in 1992. Do you know what the stop signs were? They were red, eight sides, and had S-T-O-P in English. <laughs> they have a lot of car wrecks in Romania. <laughs> What's this mean? <laughs> but, uh, but you see, here's what I'm saying. In other words, that's a rule, correct? If I tell you the sign is triangle-shaped, uh, it's white and it's got a red triangle in it, 
Uh, it's a yield sign, and that's a rule. All right, here's what they will tell you. This is a rule. You know what a rule is? A rule is, a rule is that there's such thing called law of gravity. If I let go of this, it's going to fall. You know, I have never let go of one of these and had it float up. <laughs> That's right. And it's really exciting to do that with a new King James. Amen. Amen. <laughs> but, but, um, um, this is a rule. So I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm not going to disprove this. I don't believe this, by the way. I contend there is no difference between agape and phileo. Don't say amen. Because if you say amen, you're only going to say it because you're prejudiced in favor of the King James Bible. You have no evidence to agree with it. I contend there is no difference between agape and phileo. And I'm not going to prove it. <clears throat> you are. And I need uh, Don, if you will, and, and brother, if you will come over here. And I'm going to give you guys a test. Now, now look here. Let me get one here for myself. You just pass those around to everybody. Now, please take the test. You're going to flunk this. Everybody flunks it. The only people that don't flunk this test are the people that don't take it. And you know who the people are that don't take it? They're usually visiting preachers. You'd be surprised. They're, they're King James Bible-believing preachers. That's what they'll say. And here's what they'll do. They'll know that they're going to fail this thing. So, so, so they can say they didn't fail it. They don't take it. And I've had them say this. Well, I wanted to save it, you know, so that I could study it later. What good is it without the answers? I tell them, take the test. I'll give you a blank. That is not the first blank they ever were given. <clears throat> now, when everybody's got one, we're going to, don't start it. I'll tell you when to start it. I'm going to tell you how to, how to pass this thing. Now, guys, look here. What if, I, what if I gave you a test and I said this? What if I said... Uh, <coughs> I'm going to give you a test, 25 questions, and it's going to have nothing but symbols like that. And I told you that a triangle was a three-sided uh, thing with pointy corners, and a circle was round. And I gave you 25 questions, and I said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to put a T where, it's, where it should be a triangle, and a C where it should be a circle. Don't you reckon you can pass that? Wouldn't you just go down here like this? Slide. Anyway, <laughs> but um, but I'm saying th this is this test is easy because I'm going to tell you how to pass it. Now 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 let me advise you a little bit. Don't try to pass it. In other words, I had a guy do this. See, uh, let me let me let me read the instructions. This is a test called Agape versus Phileo, and the instructions are this: read the Bible quote and put an A for Agape or P for phileo in the blank before the quote to signify your choice of the Greek word used. Definitions. Agape is a deep, intimate, selfless love. Phileo <clears throat> is a casual, friendly love. Now, I had a guy, and he thought he was going to outsmart me, and he thought, I'll bet they're all agape. So he put all A's, and he failed. If you'd like, you can put all P's. You will fail, okay? And so don't sit there, and don't, don't do this. Well, you know, um, this looks like it ought to be agape, but I'll bet it's phileo. No, I'm not, I, I want you to do this. We're going to look at 25 questions. The first 10 are how Jesus. Now, now, who was Jesus? Was he God? Yes. Isn't he the one that instituted language? That's right. Don't you reckon he knows how to speak Greek? That's right. I mean, didn't he write the rules? That's right. Yes. Okay. So I figured he could speak Greek right. So it's 10 times Jesus used to God and Phileo. We're going to look at those. And then there's 15 times that New Testament writers. Now, <clears throat> let me say you get these guys and they'll go, you know, my college professor from my alma mater. Alma mater. <laughs> you know what an alma mater is? Virgin mother. Yes. Alma is the, is the Hebrew word for, for virgin. Mater is the Greek word for mother. And when you guys have been to a college and say, that's my alma mater, who are you trying to be? Mm -hmm. yeah. Now you think about it. Who are you trying to be? Hey, nobody in here has got a virgin mother. Right? right? That's right. That's right. right. Amen. All right. So, you, so what do you say? I say, the college I went to. When I use the phrase, somebody says, Where'd you? I say, well, that's the college I went to. I don't say my alma mater. Okay? But you'll say, well, you know, at my college, you know, my alma mater, my Greek professor said this. 
and you think he's so godly because he does his, his uh, daily devotions from the Greek New Testament, blah, blah, blah. Well, I'm going to give you some testimony from, from Peter. Now, I think Peter's a little closer to God than your Greek professor. Amen. Okay? I'm going to give you some from Paul. Definitely this guy would put your Greek professor or the guy that led you to Christ or your favorite Christian guru in a box. That's right. <laughs> and John, this guy, at, when, what time was it when your Greek professor pillowed his head on the bosom of Jesus Christ yeah, and was called the beloved disciple? And here's a pretty good testimony, I believe. Amen. These three wrote under inspiration of God. This one is God. Amen. So, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to use their rules. And we're going to review 25 passages where agape and flair are used. I'm going to read them to you. And then I'll have you put an A if the, t if the context, according to their rule, should be agape. Or P, if the context, according to their rule, should be phileo. Remember, agape is a deep and of its selfless love. And phileo is a casual, friendly love. All right? Part one, how Jesus used agape and phileo. Number one, Luke chapter 11, verse 42, the love of God. All right? The love of God. What kind of love should God have for us? Should it be agape love, deep in selfless love, phileo love, casual, friendly love? Put an A or a P. Number two, John chapter 5 and verse 42, <clears throat> again, the love of God. Uh, what kind of love does God have for us? Casual, friendly love or deep, intimate, selfless love? Put an A or a P. Number three, Matthew chapter 10 and verse 37. He that loveth father or mother more than me. So what kind of love did they have for their father and mother that they should have had for Jesus Christ? Agape love, deep, intimate, selfless love, phileo love, casual, friendly love, A or P. Number four, Revelation chapter 3 and verse 9, and he says, uh, to know that I have loved thee. What kind of love does the Lord have for the church? Let's talk about the church in the last days. What kind of love does he have for the church? Agape love, deep in it, selfless love, <clears throat> phileo love, casual, friendly love, A or P. Number five, Revelation chapter 3 and verse 19, as many as I love. Again, that's uh, that, that Laodicean church. Uh, what kind of love does he have for the church? Agape love, deep in selfless love, filial love, casual, friendly love, A or P. Am I, am I giving you time to spell A or P? <laughs> Some of you look just a little dazzled there. You just... <laughs> Number six, Matthew chapter 23, verse six, talking about the, the uh, Pharisees, he said, you love the uppermost rooms. What kind of love did the Pharisees have for the uppermost rooms? <clears throat> uh, uh, an agape love, deep in selfless love, or phileo love, casual, friendly love, A or P. Number seven, John chapter 12, verse 25, he that loveth his life. What kind of love is he talking about a person having for their life? Agape love, deep in selfless love, phileo love, casual, friendly love, A or P. Number eight, uh, Luke chapter 11, verse 43, you love the uppermost seats. This is kind of the parallel to number six, uh, Matthew 23, six. He's talking to the Pharisees. He says, you love the uppermost seats. What kind of love did they have for those seats? Agape love, deep in selfless love, uh, phileo love, casual, friendly love, A or P. I actually had a guy, I actually had a guy who thought that there was a code in how I was saying agape or phileo. I said, you've been watching too many magic shows. I mean, really, guys, you know, you kind of gets scary. Worst part about it, it's my crowd. It's really scary. Uh, number 9, John chapter 5, and verse 20. The Father loveth the Son. <clears throat> what kind of love does God the Father have for Jesus the Son? Agape love, deep in it, selfless love, phileo love, casual, friendly love, A or P. Oh, you know what? I didn't tell you why we're doing this. What's that word? Ain't. All right? We're doing this to answer the question, if Jesus were on the earth right now and spoke English, would he say ain't? <laughs> I get you thinking more. <laughs> Go ahead and form an opinion. We'll get back to it. And if I, 
if I should forget, I put that up there because sometimes I forget this part, and, uh, and I, you'll want to know. Especially you guys can't speak English. All right, part two, how, how New Testament writers used agape and phileo. Number 11, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 4, talking about being lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. So what kind of a lover of pleasure were they that they should have been that kind of a lover of God? Agape love, deep in itself, selfless love. Uh, uh, flail love, casual friendly love, A for P. Number 12. Um, number 12, John chapter 11, verse 5. Uh, Jesus loved Martha. You remember Martha, covered about much serving. Mary's sister. <clears throat> Jesus loved her with, did he love her with agape love, deep in selfless love, or flail love, casual friendly love, A or P. Number 13, John chapter 20, verse 2. The uh, the other disciple whom Jesus loved. This, of course, is John, the apostle. What kind of love did, did Jesus have for John, the apostle? Agape love, deep in selfless love, phileo love, casual friendly love, A or P. Number 14, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, and verse 22. If any man, uh, the whole verse says this, if any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let it be anathema, maranath. Uh, you know what that verse reveals? That verse reveals that you can be saved and live your life under a curse if you don't love Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Then say if you don't if you don't not hate him, it says you gotta love him. So what kind of love should we have for Jesus Christ? Agape love, deep intimate selfless love, phileo love, casual friendly love, A or P. Number 17, 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 20. Uh, again, that verse says, God's not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. At least two out of three for most of you, but um, uh, what kind of spirit of love did he give us? Agape love, deep in selfless love, phileo love, casual friendly love, A or P. Number 18, Romans chapter 12 and verse 10, uh, talking about our love, our brotherly love, uh, one to another with brotherly love. Uh, what kind of love should we have for each other as brothers in Christ? Should we have agape love, deep in selfless love, uh, or phileo love, casual friendly love, A or P? 19, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 12, again, very similar to the, to the previous one, uh, abound in love one toward another. So what kind of love should we have for the brethren? Agape love, uh, deep in selfless, selfless love, or phileo love, casual friendly love, A or P? Number 20, Titus chapter 2 and verse 4, <clears throat> women to be sober to love their husbands. So what kind of love should a wife have for her husband? Agape love, deep in selfless love, or phileo love, casual friendly love, A or P. Number 21, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 28, so ought men to love their wives. What kind of love should a husband have for his wife? Should it be agape love, deep in selfless love, phileo love, casual friendly, A or P. Number 22, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 17, love the brotherhood. I, I never get to this, but I don't think it ought to be part of a mafia oath. <laughs> you know, I can just hear this guy going, love the brotherhood. Oh, we'll shoot you in the knees. Anyway, <laughs> well, what kind of love should we have for the brotherhood, for each other? Should we have agape love, <clears throat> deep intimate selfless love, or phileo love, casual friendly love, A or P? Number 23, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 1, let brotherly love continue. And again, I never read this one, but then I don't see a real song book throwing church split. <laughs> But what kind of love should we have for each other? Agape love or phileo love, uh, A or P. Number 24, 1 John chapter 2, verse 5. In him verily is the love of God perfected. So what kind of love does God have for us? Or, or what kind of love uh, is God's love? Is it agape love, deep in selfless love? Or phileo love, casual friendly love, A or P. And then <clears throat> last, uh, number 25, Titus chapter 3 and verse 4. The love of God our Savior. What kind of love does God our Savior, Jesus Christ, have for us? Does he have agape love, deep in a selfless love, or phileo love, casual friendly love, A or P? Now, you ever take a test? Well, for first off, first off, you know how you take a test and you, you trade papers? To... I'm not going to do that. I want you to grade your own. I want you to grade your own because I want you to see your answers. All right, let's go up to number one, uh, how Jesus used agape and phileo. Number one, uh, now, now remember, I contend there is no difference between agape and phileo. Um, 
If there is, we're on this test, we're assuming that, that what they teach is true, that agape is deep in with selfless love, phileos, casual, friendly love. So number one, Luke chapter 11, verse 42, the love of God. If there is a difference, <clears throat> then what should that be? Should it be, what kind of love would God have for us? Agape, agape. love or phileo? Agape. It is agape. Number two, John chapter 5 and verse 42, again, the love of God. What kind of love would God have for us? Agape or phileo? Agape. It is agape. Now, stop. I know what you're thinking. Oh, oh a piece of cake. <laughs> do, you, do you guys know what a gimme is? You know, I used to teach in a couple of colleges, and a gimme is like where we give you points for spelling your name right or something like that. Really, you know, you showed up, you get five points. Those two are the gimmies. I gave you those because now you're going to think, ooh, there's nothing to it. You better leave right now. <laughs> you don't want to go any farther <clears throat> because it, uh, it gets real from here on out. Number three, Matthew chapter 10, verse uh, 37, he that loveth father or mother more than me. So what kind of love uh, did he have for his father or, father or mother that he should have had for Jesus Christ? Agape or phileo? Agape. It is phileo. And I got all the references somewhere. Uh, probably in that teaching notebook, I've got all the references. If you, if you question me for a small amount of money, I'll let you see it. <laughs> Say, why would you make us pay? Because I will be insulted that you wouldn't believe me, and I'm going to prove you wrong, and so it's going to cost you something. Uh, number four, Revelation chapter 3 and verse 9, to know that I have loved thee. What kind of love does he have for the church? Agape or phileo? Agape. It's agape. Number five, <clears throat> Revelation chapter 3, verse 19, uh, as many as I love. Uh, uh, what does he have for the church? God there, phileo. God, God. It is phileo. Matthew chapter 23 and verse 6, talking to the Pharisees, you love the uppermost rooms. What kind of love do they have for those rooms? God there, phileo. phileo. It is phileo. Number seven, John chapter 12 and verse 25, he that loveth his life shall lose it. So what kind of love did he have for his life? Agape or phileo? Agape. Phileo. Number eight, <clears throat> John chapter, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, uh, Luke chapter 11, verse 43. This is the parallel to uh, Matthew 23, 6, uh, number 6. Uh, Luke 11, 43, you love the uppermost seats. What kind of love did they have for those seats? Agape phileo. or phileo? phileo? It is agape. <laughs> the only thing I tell people, the only thing I can figure is they walked in and went, oh, I love this room. Uh, where's the... Oh, I love these seats. <laughs> <laughs> Number 9, John chapter 5 and verse 20. The Father loveth the Son. What kind of love does God the Father have for the Son? God there or phileo? Amen. It is phileo. Mm -hmm. Number 10, <clears throat> John chapter 16, verse 27. The Father himself loveth you because you love me. What kind of love does God have for us? Agape or phileo? Phileo. How about that? Now, you know what I look forward to? You know what I look forward to? I, I do believe this. I want to believe this. I want to believe that some of the guys that, that teach this corny thing about agape and phileo, yeah. I want to think that they're saved. I don't want to think they're going to hell. And so I look forward to them being in heaven, straightening Jesus Christ out on his Greek usage. <laughs> now, don't you think that would be great? Now, whoa. Yeah, you, you should know. You know when you inspire that. That should have been agape. Well, but it's okay if you don't explain all that. <clears throat> I mean, it's going to be good. He invented language. I think he'd speak it right. That's right. Amen. How New Testament writers used to God and phileo. Number 11, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 4, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. So what kind of lovers of pleasure were they that they should have been that kind of a lover of God? God bear phileo. It is phileo. I love it. You start getting quiet. <laughs> then you start out real bold. Then someone's going, <laughs> it's a guffalo it's philagopi. <laughs> Number 12, John chapter 11 and verse 5. Jesus loved Martha. How did he love Martha? Agape or phileo? Agape. It is agape. John chapter 20 and verse 2. The other disciple whom Jesus loved. What kind of love did he have for the other disciple? John. Agape or phileo? Agape. Phileo. Now, if I were John, I'd be a little resentful. Yeah, I, mean. I mean, here's Miss Carnality herself. Comfort about much serving, and he loves her with agape love, and here I am, pulling my head on his bosom at the Last Supper, and it's just like, hey, you're okay, John. <laughs> <laughs> Number 14, 
Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 22. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema. What kind of love? God bear phileo. God it is phileo. Which, guys, look here. Peter met the test. If all that is required is phileo love, didn't Peter have it? Yeah. So what's the problem? Number 15, Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. But God commended his love toward us. What kind of love did he commend toward us? Agape. Agape. Uh, number 16, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 24. My love be with you all. Here's the Apostle Paul. Closing the Corinthian letter. Did I skip over these when we were doing the test? Yeah. 15 and 16. I thought I did. For some, for some reason. Do you guys film it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> see, see, see. Look, I've taught you. I mean, you were able to just pick it right up. Because when I was reading those two, when I was reading those two, I thought, I don't remember reading these two. This, this whatever I have is really bad. I knew what it was. The doctor told me, but now I can't remember. <laughs> anyway. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 24. My love be with you all. So what kind of love did Paul have for the Corinthians? Agape or phileo? Agape. Now, what I want you to notice is, look at number, look, look at number 14. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 22, we are told all we have to have for Jesus is phileo love. Two verses later, Paul closes the letter and says, I got more than that for you guys. Oh, yeah. Uh, 17, 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7, it got not given us a spirit of uh, fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. What kind of uh, spirit of love did he give us? Agape or phileo? Agape. It is agape. Of course, apparently, Peter didn't get that spirit. He got the phileo spirit. Number 18, Romans chapter 12 and verse 10. One to another with brotherly love. What kind of love should we have for one another? Agape love or phileo love? Have a hamburger. Phileo. Just like you do the phileo. Official. Official. Uh, number 19, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 12, abound in love one toward another. What kind of love should we have for each other? I got there for love. I got that. <laughs> number 20, Titus chapter 2, verse 4, that wives are to be sober to love their husbands. What kind of love should a wife have for her husband? <laughs> man, any man can express it. Mindless. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Phileo. <laughs> Phileo. That's what we call a handshake instead of a kiss. Oh. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 5, number 21. Ephesians chapter 5, verse uh, 28. So ought men to love their wives. What kind of love should we have for our wives? Agape or Phileo? Agape. Agape. <laughs> I'm kind of bummed out. <laughs> i got to have this deep, intimate, selfless love for my wife, and she can go, hey, you're all right. <laughs> you're probably wondering what sparked my controversy over these, these two people. <laughs> well, one day when I was doing my daily devotions for my Greek church, I stumbled upon something in Titus and Ephesians. Number 22, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 17. Love the brotherhood. I got bare flame. Oh, yeah. Better be a cop, hey, buddy, when they say it that way. You know, you know, you know. <laughs> 23, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 1. Let brotherly love continue. God bear play of. <laughs> play of. 24, 1 John chapter 2, verse 5. Verily is the love of God perfected. What kind of love does God have for us? God bear. 25, Titus chapter 3, verse 4. <clears throat> the love of God our Savior. What kind of love does God have for us? God bear phileo. Yeah. Phileo. Amen. Now, you all be saying, don't make any sense. That's right. yeah. It don't make sense if what they said about God being phileo is true. Amen. Yeah. That's right. Now, what you have to decide is, did the guy that wrote the Greek, Greek grammar book know more about Greek than Jesus, Peter, Paul, and John? Oh, yeah. Oh, wait a second. I'm going to be nice to you. I'm going to be nice to you. I'm not even, I, look, you ever have a test where they give you a, like a bonus, bonus question? I'll give you two bonus questions. And maybe you can pull this out of the fire. Look at uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 
1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And I'm going to let you do what you love to do, you bunch of Baptists. No, we're not going to eat, and we're not going to fight. <laughs> not necessarily in that order either, but um, we're going to do our third most favorite thing. We're going to vote. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 9, But as touching brotherly love, you need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. All right, now this is talking about our love one for another, correct? Okay, according to their rule, agape love, deep in it, selfless love, phileo love, casual friendly love. How many, don't be afraid to vote, how many of you say, I think that the Greek word used in that verse is agape? How many of you say, well, I think it's phileo? Now, if you didn't vote, you missed an opportunity because you're both right. Both, you, both Greek words are used in that verse. When it says, but it's touching brotherly love, that's phileo. You need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love, agape, one another. Uh, isn't that just like God? Amen. You think he hadn't got a sense of humor? He'd Amen. use both words to define the same kind of love in one verse. You see how God clears something up? That's beautiful. We went, through, we went through 25 verses, and God made it so you only had to read one. Amen. Actually, maybe two. Look at uh, 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. <clears throat> Verse 22. Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth <clears throat> through the Spirit unto unfeigned love, uh, unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Okay, we're going to vote again. How many of you say, now again, that's, that's brotherly love, brotherly love that we have for each other. How many of you say that the Greek word used there is agape? How many of you say it's phileo? Okay, guys, this is wonderful. You're both right. It's both. Amen. Unto unfeigned love of the brethren, he uses the word phileo. See that you love one another, he uses agape. And they're both describing the same love. Now, God does not acknowledge this rule. Hey, right. That's right. Okay? Right. Now, if God doesn't acknowledge it, if you, the Holy Spirit, if, if Peter, Jane, or Peter, John, Paul, and Jesus Christ himself didn't acknowledge it, I got news for you. I don't care about your Greek professor. Hey, right. Right. I don't care about who, what you... Well, I, I've, got a, I've got a Greek grammar book, and it says it right there. Let me tell you what I did <clears throat> many years ago. I'm going to answer some questions because you ought to have some questions about this. But let me give you a couple things. I, I, I was sitting in a restaurant and, um, and I'm with this, uh, this preacher. And I'll be honest, this guy, he's a good preacher and he has got, he has got a photographic memory. He really does. I have a photographic memory, just never developed. <laughs> but, but this guy literally had committed whole passages of scripture and this guy would preach and he would hit a verse and go for 10 or 12 verses 15 verses just quote them boom 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 it was ideal and he was a quote unquote King James Bible guy but he did use Greek and he didn't use Greek to correct the Bible of course not I'm enhancing the Bible mm -hmm. you'll have people say I'm not correcting the Bible I'm enhancing it my response to that is this how do you make round round <laughs> yeah. yeah that's good yeah. how do you make straight straight or how do you make flat flat come on Guys, if, if we asked the Lord to come in here today and asked him to draw a circle, if he went like this, now, mind you, mine won't be perfect, but if he went like that, what would you do? Come up here and go, well, no, that's not bad, God. You know, a little bit high over here. How do you improve on round? How do you make round rounder? <laughs> How do you improve on round? If we ask the Lord, look, look, straight, you want straight? We could put God, we put him at the back of the sanctuary, put a bag over his head, put him on a pogo stick, turn the lights out at night. He could come hopping by here backwards. If we said draw a straight line, he'd go, and it would be straight. That ain't straight. He'd draw one straight. Amen. Now, what are you going to do? I want to watch you come up yeah, here and correct right. him. Yeah. Somebody says, well, I'm just enhancing the Bible. How do you make round round? How do you make straight straight? If God leveled the field, you think you're going to find a high spot? 
Yeah. What do you need? Build the house, bucko. Mm -hmm. He's yeah. not on the field, just build the house. Amen. So I'm talking to this guy in a restaurant, because we're Baptist preachers, and that's what we do. And um, and <clears throat> and he uses the Greek. And it's me, and, and it's me, and he's here, and I've got a Cuban pastor friend sitting right across the table from me. He loves King James Bible, believes King James Bible. And, I, and we got talking, and I said, well, you know, you use the Greek, you correct the Bible. He goes, no, I'm not correcting, I'm enhancing. I said, well, let me ask you a question. I'm going to ask you this question. I said, I have in my hand a Greek grammar book. I said, I have in my other hand the Bible. Amen. I said, this Greek grammar book has a rule in it. I didn't tell him what the rule was. It was this. I said, this Greek grammar book has a rule in it, and this Bible violates... That rule. You just saw it. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, right. I said, I said, which one's wrong? Good question. He said, um, uh, I don't understand the question. <laughs> I said, okay. I said, I have a Greek <laughs> grammar book in this hand. I have a Bible in this hand. The Greek grammar book has a rule. The Bible violates the rule of the Greek grammar book, which one's, which one's wrong? Uh, I don't understand the question. <laughs> wow. I said, okay, I've got a Greek grammar book here, I've got a Bible here, Greek grammar book has a rule, Bible has a, violates it, which one's right? Understand? <laughs> Honest, here's what I did. I said, I thought maybe there was a, you know, some childhood problem with left hand, right hand. I, I said, <laughs> I did this. I said, I'll trade hands. <laughs> I said, I have a Greek grammar book in this hand. I have a Bible in this hand. I said, the Greek grammar book has a rule. The Bible violates it. Which one's right? He goes, now, now, now guys, look, we shouldn't dance. Right. This guy was doing it sitting down. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. yeah. I don't understand the question. Now, four times he did that. But here's what he did not see. He did not see my Cuban pastor friend. My Cuban pastor friend, who, who has... Who, who loves King James Bible and has a Cuban temper. <laughs> and, and he is sitting here, honest, because this guy's doing his dance. He's, he's sitting there like this. He's got a knife in one hand, a fork in the other, and he is, he is bending them. And he goes, and the fourth time, he never even looks up. He goes, it's not that hard a question, brother. <laughs> and the guy goes, the Bible. <laughs> he's also a motivational therapist. <laughs> Then we took him. Then I took him back to the motel, wow. the hotel where we were staying, and I gave him this test, and he flunked. Yeah. Because if you've got a Greek grammar book and it has a rule, and the Bible violates the Greek grammar book, pitch the yeah. Greek grammar book. Yeah. 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 All, right. Yeah. All right. Now I know what you. Uh, <clears throat> I know what you're thinking. You ought to be thinking this. Well, then where did this rule come from? Where did this come from? Well, <clears throat> I'll, I'll explain that. Let me explain this. You know, we get done here, and I think my next meeting is up in Seattle. And so um, we are going to hit uh, Interstate 5, and we're going to uh, hit Interstate 5 South, and we're going to go to Seattle. We're going to have our next <laughs> Yeah, right. Where are you left? That's the wrong road. It, it, isn't it I-5? North. All right, I'm going to hit I-5 South, and I'm going to go down North. to Seattle. North. 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 Are you, am I on the wrong road? No, you're on the right road. <laughs> What's the problem? Wrong direction. Oh. I'm on the right road going the wrong direction, and I'll never get there. Right? That's right. right. I'll tell you where I think this came from. This came from somebody being on the right road going the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. Those guys that do their, their, their devotions from the Greek New Testament, there you go. one day one of those guys was wasting his time doing his... Devotions from the Greek New Testament came across the Gape Phileo, Gape Phileo, 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 and said, hmm, there must be a nugget here in the Greek. You know what the problem was? He had his back to a That's gold right. line. That's right. Amen. That's right. He was on the right road, the Bible, but it was the Greek one. He was going the wrong direction. Amen. Um, you ought to ask this. Okay, then. How come Jesus used agape and agape and phileo? I mean, he did use two different Greek words. Why did he do it? The answer to that is found in Matthew chapter 16. Go there. Matthew chapter 16. 
In Matthew chapter 16, here's what the Lord is doing. He's kind of abrading the, Pharise uh, the, the, uh, the apostles. And he's talking to them <clears throat> about the times uh, when he fed the 5,000 and fed the 4,000. You guys are familiar with those two, two portions of Scripture. Look what he says in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 9. Do you not yet understand, neither remember the five loaves of the 5,000, how many baskets you took up? Neither the seven loaves of the 4,000, how many baskets you took up? Guess what? You see, see the word basket in both those verses? He used two different Greek words. Hmm. They're not the same Greek word. You say, oh, you mean they're from a different, they're, they're from the same root. They're not from the same root. The Greek word, <clears throat> the Greek word that he used in verse 9 for baskets is the Greek word kofinus. The Greek word that he used in verse 10 for baskets is the Greek word spiridos. Now, now, if you don't know Greek, you can still see that those are two different Greek words. Sure. Now, now, look at that. In, one, in two verses, the Lord used two different Greek words for baskets. In one, he says kofinus, verse 9. In verse 10, he says spiridos. You know why that is? I know why it is. You know why it is? Kofinus. These are deep, intimate, selfless baskets. <laughs> Spurdos, these are casual, friendly baskets. <laughs> you really want to know why that is? He's God. He can do what he wants. Amen. It's one of the perks of the job. Amen. You think I'm kidding? You think I'm stretching? Go back to John chapter 21. John chapter 21. That'll give you two Greek words up here, guys. Right. You know what those are? Look at verse 15. Verse 15, he says, uh, Feed my lambs. Verse 16, he says, Feed my sheep. Verse 17, he says, Feed my lambs. You know what Bosca and Pamina are? Those are the two different Greek words he used for feed. He never used one Greek word for feed. He never used one Greek word for, for sheep. He said lambs, sheep, sheep. He never used one Greek word for anything. In verse 15, in, Greece, in, 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 in uh, 15, he used baska, feed my lambs. In 16, he used uh, pomina. And back in 17, he went back to baska. He used, he used two different Greek words for the word feed. Why can't he use two different, different Greek words for the word love? Sure. He's God. Amen. Correct him. Go ahead, correct him. I want to be there. Mm -hmm. I want to be about 50 feet off. I don't want to get singed. I just want to see the blue white flash. <laughs> all right. Oh, man, I hate to tell you this. After doing all this, I hate to tell you this. But remember something, guys. Now, if you've been with me these last couple days, I've shown you. How God has made the truth so simple. If, remember, remember we looked at, a, at, at um, uh, Antioch and Alexandria? Mm -hmm. And I told you I've read about 100 books on this subject. And I told you you don't have to read one book. You don't even have to read, read one chapter. You don't even have to read 10 verses. Read 9 verses of one chapter and God put the answer right there. Yeah. Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 9. Uh, verse, uh, what was it, 5. You have Antioch, first time mentioned, it's good. Verse 9, Alexander mentioned, first time it's bad. If you really accept the Bible as your final authority, it's taken care of. Yep. If you really accept the Bible as your final authority, those two references in First uh, Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 9, and First Peter chapter 1, verse 22, were used agape and phileo, both in the same verse, for one kind of love, should have told you. Yep. But this
this passage should have told me. Look what it says in verse 17. Now, now, <clears throat> look up here for a second. Well, a little more. All right. Jesus Christ said, agape, agape. How many times did he say that? Five. You guys are fast. <laughs> and here he said, phileo. How many times did he say that? Once. All right. Now you'll see where I lied to you at the beginning, because all them fundamentalists lie when they read that passage. Let's read verse 17 again. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And I heard the guy. I heard the guy when he was teaching this passage. He said, now see, Peter was grieved because he went from agape to phileo. That's not what he was grieved about. What was he grieved about? That he asked him three times. Let me ask you a question, guys. What did he ask him three times? Mm -hmm. He asked him agape too. Mm -hmm. He asked him phileo one. Yeah. Right. He didn't ask him anything three times. Unless he asked him, do you love me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, right there in the context, it was taken care of. Now the answer to the great question. If Jesus Christ were alive today and spoke English, would he say it? Being Baptist, because I'm benevolent, I'm going to let you vote again. And don't worry about this. Don't, don't be afraid. You guys are so afraid of being, you know, making a mistake or being wrong. How many of you believe if Jesus Christ were on the earth today and he spoke English, he would not say ain't? Okay? Okay. How many of you say if Jesus Christ were on the earth today and he spoke English, he would say ain't? You know what the answer is? I don't know. <laughs> oh, really? I mean, how in the world would I know? Right? Sure. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. But listen. But if he did... It'd be good grammar. Sure. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, I like That's right. that. Yeah, I like that. And if I had an English grammar book that said, ain't is not good English, and Jesus said ain't, and I'd say, hey, Jesus, this says you're not supposed to say ain't. Ain't's bad grammar. He'd go, ain't that something? <laughs> yeah, that's right. If, all I'm saying, I'm not saying he would say ain't or not. I have no way of knowing. But if I got a grammar book that says you can't say ain't, and he did, I'd know he was right. Yeah. right. Amen. And the grammar book was wrong. Yeah. Okay? Amen. Because he's never wrong. Amen. He's always Amen. right. He's God. And if I got a grammar book, and I got a Bible, and the grammar book, English or Greek, has a rule, and my Bible violates that rule, pitch the grammar book. Amen. Amen. But Amen. I have been wanting to do that since the 8th grade anyway. Amen. <laughs> all right. All right, guys. I am done. <clears throat> Pastor asked me uh, earlier if I would ask answer some questions, and so uh, uh, let's let's give you a couple of minutes at least here, maybe till twelve o'clock. Uh, anybody's got any questions? Got any questions on the King James Bible? Um, go for it. Go for it, ma'am. Is there a difference in the publishing? She asked if there's a difference in the publishing. Actually, there there is. Uh, there's a historic difference between the Oxford and the Cambridge. Um, I have not, I've heard that. I've not put them side by side and looked at the differences, so I can't tell you what they are. Uh, there's also a difference in some of the newer ones. Uh, some of the newer ones will update spelling. Uh, they'll make thoroughly, or thoroughly, thoroughly. Uh, Job chapter 2 and, and Job chapter 3, I think it's 3 verse 15, 13, uh, where it says wine vats. It'll say wine fats. And, and let me, in fact, let me give you something on this because there's a, there tends to be some problems in our churches over this. In Job, uh, my Bible says, oops, I'm going to say that. My Bible says wine fats. But there are some King James Bibles that say wine vats. Uh, in my Bible... It says David, David hewed the horses, and some of them says he hopped the horses. And you go, well, what's the problem? And I'm going to tell you now. Some of you have to be, be happy, but you've got to grow up a little. Um, I'll tell you where a lot of this comes from. This comes from churches that print Bibles.
-hmm. Yep. Now, guys, there's no copyright on the King James Bible, correct? Sure. I got a King James Bible there. There's no copyright on the text, but I've got an old Schofield. There's a copyright on Schofield's notes. There's a copyright on Usher's dates. There's a copyright on the marginal references. There's a copyright on the concordance. I can copy the text. I can't copy anything else. So here you get this church, and they're going to they're going to print a Bible. And understand what I'm about to say when I say it's inferior to this one. Inferior, because guys, I like I like marginal references. I like to be reading in Romans and go, oh, this is an Old Testament quote. Where is that? And I look at my margin, it says Isaiah something. There's nothing wrong with that. Sure. But they can't print them. So they print this, this five and dime store, or oh, there's an old statement. Uh, five and dime store, dollar store, um, there you go. Bible. And it's got nothing, it's got nothing to offer but the text. And so they go, they go, and how do I make this look attractive? Do you have a Bible printed by the world? Yeah. You know, yeah. the church ought to keep take care of the word of God. And if you've got a Bible printed by the world, why don't you know they might have printed pornography on those presses just before they printed your Bible? And, and so then, and now remember what I told you? In lieu of conviction, intimidation will work. Mm -hmm. right. And they'll say, we have Bibles that are untouched by man's notes. And you buy a Bible that's not as easy to use because you don't have the notes. And one of the things they'll say is this. Does your Bible say fats or vats? Does your Bible say hewed or hawked? See if you've got a real King James Bible. Yeah. And then you've got a bunch of King James Bible believers that are bumping heads with each other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, that ain't of God. That's right. Right. That's right. And I'm going to tell you what the answer is. The answer is very simple. And I'm going to answer this for you because you'll answer wrong. I'm going to ask you to think the answer to this. What is the smallest unit of preservation? Now, immediately sometimes people will say, well, jots and tittles. No. No, Jesus said that jots and tittles would only be around until the law was fulfilled. Right? They wouldn't pass away. Did, did he fulfill the law? Yeah. Amen. Guess what? They passed away. Now, I know we like to say, well, that's the dot of an I and the cross of a T. No, that's a jot and that's a tittle. Those are Hebrew letters. That's not a T and a dotted I. The smallest unit of preservation, try this. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried at first birth, um, purified seven times. Thou, thou shalt keep what? Them. 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 What's he keeping? The words. The words. Not the letters, the words. What did he say? Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my what? Words. Letters? Words. letters. Did he say letters? No. Well, he said words. My words. The smallest unit of preservation is not a letter, it's a word. You know what a wine fat is? A wine fat is a wine vat. That's what it is. It is the same word with a different spelling. Now you can say, whoa, whoa, no, wait, please don't please understand something. I'm not, I'm not in favor of updating our King James Bible spelling. I'll tell you, you see this one here? You know where I got the answer for that? I, I read everything, guys. I really do. I read everything. And I got the answer for that uh, reading a book about airplanes. I was reading a book about airplanes that was started by these guys here. There were two brothers and a cousin. And they started the Low Head Airplane Company. Mm. And it failed. They started another and it failed. They started a third one. They were scoffed. And, and you know what they decided? They decided they, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't spell it the way it was spelled. They'd spell it the, the way that this was pronounced. Yeah. And this is pronounced <coughs> Lockheed. Lockheed. <laughs> now, you know what you've got to remember something about your Bible? You don't have an American Bible, you have an English Bible. When we say English, we're talking England English, not just language, we're talking England. When it talks about uh, she alighted from off her ass, today in England, we say the plane landed. You land in England, they don't say the plane landed, they say it alighted. They speak like that Bible, because that's an English Bible, not just English language, but English culture. And, and, L-O-U-G-H is pronounced lock. In fact, in England, Scotland, sometimes they'll have that word for a lake. Yeah. 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 All right? So, and, and I look, I don't put the, um, the Webster's 1828 as my final authority. Amen. 
It is the oldest English Bible we have. I think it's a good one. Uh, Oxford English Bible is a very good one. But, but, but it was 200 years after the King James Bible. But if you do this, if you go to your, <clears throat> your uh, Webster's uh, 1828 and look up Hawk, there's the pronunciation, Hawk. If you look up Hugh, there's the pronunciation, Hawk. That's the same word. Now you say, well, yeah, but that thoroughly and thoroughly, those are two different, oh, really? Okay, read your Bible. And every time the word thoroughly appears, put thoroughly. And every time the word thoroughly appears, put thoroughly. You know what you're going to find out? They're the same word. Now, I, I know, I know, we want to make a big deal about the letters because we're going to say, you know, it's, it's kind of like studying Greek. You don't have to do a lot of study. You can just point and say, mine's better than yours. But, um, but the fact is that there is no difference. And if you're going to say there is, if you're going to say, no, brother, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm going to do it with you. Letters are important, are they? Then you all better get rid of your King James Bibles. Mm. You know why? Because it doesn't spell sun like that. That's right. Yeah. And that's the way they did in 1611. And they spelled evil. Come on. Like that. Now what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, it's okay to get rid of those letters, but it's not okay to get rid of those. Are you God? Mm. Now, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. You got to. See, here's what I'm going to say, guys. You're going to you're going to draw a line somewhere. You're either going to draw it where it's okay to get rid of this and okay to get rid of this, or you're going to draw it in between them. But who are you to say it's okay to get rid of these, but not okay to get rid of these? Please understand. I know what that does. That leaves the door open for some. Some crook to use my words and say, well, I'm going to bring out a King James Bible. I want to update all of the spelling. I don't want them to. No. I'm not for it. I broke my point. But um, I, I'm not for it, all right? All I am saying is don't get caught up because some, some Bible church, some church that prints the Bible came in here and stirred you up about fats and vats or anything like that. So, so what I'm saying, sis, is sometimes you get a, a, a world Bible and it might have that. By the way, I want it to say fats. I want it to say hot, spelled that way. Okay? I like thoroughly in 2 Timothy. I don't like thoroughly. But there's nothing wrong with it. All right. Another question, sir. Uh, what's the difference between King James and like a Geneva Bible that our founding fathers brought over here and the other Bibles that were printed in the same, uh, you know, the English? Uh, previous, previous King James? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, he's asking, and I'm going to frame this question kind of the way sometimes some guys say it. They'll say, um, <clears throat> you know, King James Bible. Why the King James Bible when there were other, there were, there were other uh, English translations? And those other English translations were like, um, hang on up. Um, you had the, the uh, Tyndale. Miles Coverdale, uh, Thomas Matthews, um, you had the bishops, you had the great, <coughs> you had Geneva. Now, the reason I put those in two different colors is this reason <clears throat> to, to uh, show you the difference. Every Bible prior to the King James was, was either a one-man translation or a one-group translation. This was, the, this was Anglican, this was Anglican, this was the uh, Puritans. The King James Bible, the, the one thing about the translators of the King James Bible was they were Anglicans and Puritans. You know what that was? That was Democrats and Republicans. <coughs> and that's what it was. They didn't like each other at all. Some of those guys on the King James Translation Committee didn't like each other. That's right. But here's what the Puritans did. The Puritans kept it from being all Anglican, and the Anglicans kept it from being all Puritan. Yeah, right. And the brother's right. <clears throat> it is the Geneva that in 1620 was under the arm uh, of the um, 
uh, of the uh, pilgrims when they got off at, uh, uh, at the, off the Mayflower at Plymouth Rock. But 1620, that's where this nation got its start. But but 150 years later, when we de de declared our independence, that one had been supplanted by the King James Amen. Bible. If you ever read yeah. any quotes from our founding fathers, that's the book they quote. Amen. They quote a King James Bible. So that's basically the difference. But um, all of these, uh, I didn't put Wycliffe up here. Wycliffe would be the, uh, uh, the exception. Wycliffe wasn't even translated from Greek. It was translated from Latin. It was translated from Jerome's Latin, which was uh, Alexandrian Latin. All of these came from the uh, Antiochian manuscripts. So they all came from the same manuscripts as your King James Bible. But, um, but two things were happening. One, they were either all one group. Also, all the way through these, the English language was still developing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it really was finished around the end of the 16th century, late 1500s, 15, 1590s. And so uh, King James, you know, everybody says, well, King James didn't want to do it. He didn't want to do it. Sat on the throne in 1603. First thing he said in 1604 was, get me a Bible. Okay. Um, is that an question? question? Okay. Sir. Paul. In terms of King James Bible and the authorized version 1611 synonymous? Yeah. Yeah, it's the King James, uh, you know, you, you, you want the whole name, King James Authorized Version. Uh, it's King James Bible. It's Authorized Version. Uh, I really don't like KJV. Sure. I don't like King James Version. And what that's done <clears throat> is um, they bring out a New American Standard, and they call it the New American Standard Bible. And they call it the New King James Bible. Mm -hmm. And like those are a Bible, this is just a version. Uh -huh. Which is why I call those all versions and this from the Bible. Hey. Mm -hmm. And I only identify with KJV because somebody may, you know, who's totally green and doesn't understand things. Are you are you one of those KJV guys? Say yeah. But but if I'm going to define it, it's going to be KJB or A V. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like that. But yeah, there's not. Somebody else another question? Sir. Um, I had a question about the uh the last, was it chapter 16 in Mark? Uh-huh. When they talk about it, it not being in some of the manuscripts. Last 12 verses. Does that have to do with the whole Antioch and... Uh, yes. What he's asking, uh, some of the modern translations, they either delete the last 12 verses of Mark, or they separate from the text, put a short ending, uh, and they say the last 12 verses of Mark don't belong there. Um, there are... There are somewhere around... Now, this is really a round figure. There's somewhere around 5,500 manuscripts, portions, etc. Not all of those are going to have Mark in them. Not all of those are going to have the end. Mark is only missing those last 12 verses from two of them. One of those two leaves the page blank where it belongs. And, um, and the other one um, has it, and I'm trying to remember how this works. It was crowded in. But here's what happened. <clears throat> in some of the early copies, they would use the Bible in Sunday school, and they would, you know, like you're gonna like, all right, let's say your pastor is gonna is gonna teach Romans verse by verse, and he's gonna teach this this block of verses, not just five verses, five verses, five verses, but you know, these verses are related, these first eight, and then these next ten, and then these next three. Well, at the end of places like that, they put the end. And, and it, would, it would say the end five times in a chapter. Because it's not the end of a chapter. It was the end of that block. And what happened was that right there before, before uh, see, what was it, verse 9? Uh, right at right, yeah, the end of verse 8, at the bottom of the page it says the end. The page is removed and people thought that that was the end of Mark. But that really was, was not honest because, because all of the extant manuscripts except except for two corrupt Alexandrians, yeah. uh, have the ending in it. Wow. Wow. I was also going to ask, um, the translations we have in the manuscripts, are they, are they all Greek, or are they a mixture of Greek, Hebrew, and uh, Aramaic? No Aramaic whatsoever. Um, Old Testament Hebrew, a uh, portion of it is uh, in Daniel, is Syrian, Syriac. Uh, I think it's like Daniel chapter, I want to say two... Verse 4 to like 7 verse 2 is all in Syriac. But, but we can still safely say the Old Testament's in Hebrew and the New Testament's in Greek. Yes. Now, there have been some Latin translations. Of course, there have been, there have been a lot of translations of the New Testament. But the originals were written in Hebrew, Old Testament, Greek, New Testament. And um, let, me, let me show you something. Let me show you something. If I could about those last 12 verses. Uh, open your Bible.
Bibles to um, Luke chapter 24. <clears throat> Luke chapter 24. Verse 51. And it came to pass while he blessed them, he was parted from heaven and carried up into heaven. I'm sorry, parted. He was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And that is the ascension, obviously, of Jesus Christ, correct? Amen. All right. I'm going to read that <clears throat> from my porcelain wonder. New International Version, or New American Standard Version. Amen. Read along with me. Uh, and, it came, uh, and it came about that while he was blessing them, he parted from them. Mm -hmm. Just went somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't sin. Yeah. And carried up into heaven is not found here. Mm -hmm. Now I know what you're going to say. Well, and, and sometimes this happens. Sometimes they'll move a verse marking. So maybe it's in the beginning of verse 52. Uh, I'm going to read, uh, well, in fact, I'll just read verse 52 from this. You follow along in your Bible. And they returned to Jerusalem with great joy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whoa, something else. Well, he couldn't get off the ground. Why does he deserve worship? Really? Right. Now, <clears throat> wow. let me give you the manuscript evidence for those changes. is not found in, uh, that's Aleph. It's actually, it's actually an Aleph with a one. That's a, uh, that's a one copy uh, of uh, Sinaiticus. That is an Alexandrian manuscript. It's not found in D. D is kind of a standalone aberration. Uh, they used to think that it was called the Western family. Most scholars don't even count it uh, as a complete family. It's just kind of a weird thing. It's kind of like a you know, your kid's got a third eye or something. <laughs> it's found in a uh, cursive, number 52. And it's found in a 5th century palimpsest. And, and what that is, that's, that is a, uh, you know, in Bible days they wrote, as you see on your walls, they, they wrote on animal skins. And you didn't go down to the stationery store and buy stationery. It was very expensive. So, <clears throat> so if somebody wrote you a letter on, on, a, on animal skin, after you read it, you'd take a rock, like an eraser, and you'd scrape that thing until there was no writing on it, and then you'd write somebody else a letter. And so this is like uh, somebody's, uh, you know, somebody took the, the Bible or, or, or took a, a, a letter and scratched it off and then wrote something over top. And that is all the evidence that does not have and carried up into heaven in it. Here's where it's in. This is, uh, let's get this straight so you know what's out. And in. All right. It is in, now get this, B. Now, if you know anything about Bible manuscripts at all, the two main manuscripts that usually stand against the King James Bible that are Alexandrian are Aleph and B, Sinaiticus and Vaticanus. Yep. B usually stands against your King James Bible. This is one of those times when it stands with it. What I'm saying is that these are, these are two of the scholars' darlings. These are their favorite, their favorite witnesses, which means they cancel each other out. Okay, and authority, wait, they can't cancel each other out. There's what you got. 
All right, it's found in, uh, these, are, these are unsealed manuscripts, capital letter manuscripts. It, it's found in B, C, E, F, G, H, L, S, TV, which is the only good TV, by the way. <laughs> Why? Because the other one is no good. <laughs> Z, manuscript delta, manuscript theta, manuscript Z, manuscript omega. Then there's a, a, a kind of a sister manuscript in papyrus to the Vaticanus that many times stands against King James Bible called P75. It also has and carried up into heaven. And then if you had a 